Today we'll be presenting on the Mars Exploration Rover mission. Our team consists of Chance Amos, Isabel King, Chris Larson, Cole Pazar, and myself, Tao Nguyen. NASA's Mars Exploration Rover mission was a robotic space exploration mission that landed two identical rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, on the Martian surface. Both were equipped with a suite of instruments to explore the Martian surface and geology. Spirit and Opportunity were launched on separate launch vehicles in the summer of 2003, and they landed on opposite sides of Mars about six months later. Spirit landed in Gusev Crater, while Opportunity landed in Meridiani Planum. Spirit traveled a total of 7.7 .7 kilometers before it became stuck in soft sand back in 2009. It continued its mission as a stationary science platform until its last communication in 2010. Opportunity traveled a total of 45.2 kilometers. Its last communication came before a global dust storm in 2018 that covered the rover's solar panels and it wasn't able to restart. Before I go over and list the objectives of the Mars Exploration Rover, it might help to talk a little bit about the overarching goals of the mission. These are shared by most other missions within NASA's Mars Exploration Program. These goals include the big questions of whether there was ever life on Mars, the characterization of the climate and geology of Mars, and general preparation for a future human exploration mission to Mars. The seven mission objectives all help achieve these four goals. The first objective was to characterize rocks and soils with the aim at looking for clues about past water activity. The second objective was to determine the distribution and composition of rocks and soils and produce geologic maps. The third objective was to determine the geologic processes that may have occurred in Mars past. Um, this could have included water and wind erosion, sedimentation, hydrothermal mechanisms, volcanism, and cratering. The fourth objective was to provide ground truth for observations made by Mars orbiter instruments. The fifth objective was to study iron containing minerals and water containing minerals, such as carbonates. The sixth objective was aimed at studying rocks and soils to find out what processes created them. And lastly, the seventh objective was to search for clues as to what Mar the Martian environment was like when water was present. This objective included answering whether the water was present for a long time or not, and whether the environment could have supported life. I'm gonna hand things off to Chris now, and he's going to tell us about instruments on board both rovers that were used to achieve these objectives. Hello, everyone. Over the course of the next set of slides, I will be describing the eight instruments carried by each rover as listed. As you can see, there is a description of the location for these instruments on a rover, as well as a more focused depiction for those located on the instrument deployment device or IDD. Panoramic camera or pan cameras comprised of two multi-wavelength cameras working together to produce 3D panoramic color images of the Martian surface, sky, and the sun in the rover's area of operation. It scans the horizon in search of landscape features that could be further evaluated for the presence of water in Mars past. It also facilitates spectral analysis of minerals in the surrounding rocks and soils and is used to determine aerosol opacity and physical properties from direct imaging of the sun and sky. Some key spec parameters for each camera eye are image size is 1024 by 1024 pixels, angular resolution of 0.28 millirads per pixel, and an eight filter color wheel to enable near UV to near IR imaging at 400 to 1100 nanometers. Up next is the microscopic imager. The MI acquires extreme close up high resolution black and white images of target rocks and soils. This imaging is used to analyze the size and shape of grains in sedimentary rocks for identifying whether water may have existed in Mars past. In addition, its imagery is used to help search for targets of opportunity for other rover instruments. Some key spec parameters are image size is 1024 by 1024 pixels, image resolution is 0.031 millimeters per pixel, and it can resolve 0.1 millimeter target features. The miniature thermal emission spectrometer measures IR emissivity of target objects from a standoff distance. Mini-TESS is used to determine the mineralogy of rocks and soils, the thermophysical properties of selected soil patches, and the temperature profile, dust opacity, water ice opacity, 
and water vapor abundance in the lower boundary layer of the Martian atmosphere. Key spec parameters include a spectral resolution of 5 to 29 microns and a field of view of 20 millirad with an actuated field stop that can reduce the field of view to 8 millirads. The Mossbauer spectrometer is used to determine for rock, soil, and dust, one, the mineralogical identification of iron bearing phases such as oxides, silicates, sulfides, sulfates, and carbonates. Two, the quantitative measurement of the iron distribution among these phases. And three, the quantitative measurements of the iron distribution among its oxidation states. The MB can be placed right up to rock and soil samples for close up study. It also examines magnetic dust samples collected by the magnetic array on the rover's deck. A single MB measurement for an area 15 to 20 millimeters in diameter takes approximately 12 hours. The alpha particle X-ray spectrometer measures how different materials of target rocks and soils respond to X-ray and alpha particle radiation to identify their elemental chemistry in order to learn more about the planet's crust and weathering effects. The APXS X-ray spectra show elements starting from sodium up to yttrium, depending on their concentrations. The backscattered alpha spectra provide additional data on carbon and oxygen. For a 38 millimeter diameter sample area, the APXS requires at least 10 hours of accumulation time and data acquisition is mostly performed at night. The rock abrasion tool is used as the rover's equivalent of a geological hammer and rock brush. The RAT is a three axis precision tool that uses rotating grinding teeth to expose the fresh outer surfaces of rocks to other instruments for further evaluation. It also uses rotating brushes to remove dust and debris from an excavated hole or an unaltered rock target to support detailed observations and analyses. The rack can grind a 45 millimeter diameter by five millimeter deep hole in a hard volcanic rock surface in approximately two hours. The magnet array includes three sets of magnets mounted on different locations on the rover that are used to collect airborne magnetic dust particles for analysis by the science instruments. One set of four magnets is located on the rat, a second set of two magnets are on the front of the rover and are accessible by the Mossbauer and APXS instruments, and a single magnet on the rover deck is viewed by the pan cam. Finally, each rover has calibration targets with known material properties used to verify that the PanCam, Mossbauer, APXS, and mini test instruments are working properly. Some interesting features of calibration targets are the PanCam uses sundial mounted on the rover deck with colored blocks in the corners for calibrating color and landscape images. Pictures of shadows cast by the sundial center post are for adjusting image brightness. The APXS uses a slab of well-characterized basaltic rock inside its dust doors, and the Mossbauer spectrometer uses a thin slab of magnetite-rich rock. Thank you very much, and now I'll hand it off to Isabel. Thanks, Chris. Now that you've heard about each of the instruments, I'm going to tell you about where you can find the data that they collected. The primary place that we're now all familiar with is the Geosciences node on the Planetary Data System. This hosts all available data from each of the instruments you just heard about in raw file formats and when available, reduced and otherwise processed data formats. Also in the PDS is a very comprehensive analyst notebook, which I'll talk more about in a moment. On other nodes of the PDS, namely the imaging and atmosphere nodes, you can find data from the IMUs during the rover's descent and landing, in addition to HASCAM and NAVCAM images. The software interface specifications, which provide details on interpreting and actually using the data, are found in the appropriate PDS directory. So for example, the SIS for a given instrument is in the same node and in the same directory as the data itself. Another useful place to look for certain data is the Planetary Image Atlas, which is hosted by JPL. This only has PanCam and microscopic imager data, but it's a useful directory because unlike the nodes in the PDS, you can more easily filter and sort the data products and view a thumbnail of the visual product while you're searching. Also worth noting is that the Mars Exploration Rover data are not available in handy tools like JMARS or Quick Maps, and it's really just because of the small scale relative to the orbital data sets that those tools are meant to display. Instead, the most intuitive way to look at the data is probably to use the Analyst Notebook. 
So I mentioned earlier, this is a really useful tool and that's because it's well organized and well documented. It lets you filter for information in a variety of ways. So first you can look at the data in an annotated soul by soul list. Perhaps more interestingly, you can look at it as a list by a list of science targets, um, which are also listed on the page chronologically. In the bottom right here, I'm looking at a spirit science target, which is named Trout One. Um, and you can see that the point of interest is circled in red in the visual spectrum image and the associated data products are right there next to it. Another good way to look for information is by looking at the map location. So in the top right, you can see Spirit's entire traverse and you can click on any point along, along it to see the available data products. Um, lastly, you can also sort by instrument, which is uh, what I have a screenshot of here on the bottom left. Obviously, this is all super useful because you can sort these in whatever way is intuitive or use, useful to you or your project. Um, if there's a visual data product available, you can take a quick look at it right inside the tool um, and you can see all of the process data and just download whatever data product you're looking for from within the tool rather than having to go searching for it in the PDS. So lastly, I will speak to the specific data products that exist for each instrument in the PDS Geosciences node. Um, so you can see, for example, that APXS has the raw and reduced data products. And in addition, it has oxide abundance data. So um, this last one is essentially just further process data that the science team has made available. Um, and this is actually specifically a file that you can open up in Excel, so it is re very readily usable. Moss Bauer is very similar in that it has the raw and reduced data products. Um, and in addition, it has this further processed CSV file of information, in this case, specifically the iron abundance data. The microscopic Im imager only has the raw and reduced data products available. Uh, meanwhile, the mini test instrument has raw and reduced data products in addition to the further processed emissivity and brightness temperature records. Um, I've shown here on the right a picture of just what that data looks like in the analyst notebook. And similarly, PanCam has a wide range of process data products. Um, so for example, there's the process data products that are specific to the black and white or to the color mosaic images. Um, another interesting one here is the atmospheric opacity data set. Um, and that's where the PanCam images the, image the sun and sky with certain filters to learn more about the atmosphere. So lastly, there's the rock abrasion tool. Um, and this just has the raw data products that are related to its operations. Um, this is perhaps more of an engineering data product. Um, but on this subject, something that's interesting to consider is that many of these spectrometers like the APXS and the Moss Bauer were both used with and without the rock abrasion tool to teach us different things about the exposed and weathered surfaces as compared to the freshly abraded surfaces. So now I'll pass it off to Chance to talk about the findings that these instruments enabled. I'm going to talk about some of the major findings from both the SPIRIT and Opportunity rovers. Starting with SPIRIT, this image represents the first surface-based observation of Martian dust devils. SPIRIT actually wound up observing over 500 dust devils within Gusev Crater. Uh, and these observations help us to understand the formative and dynamic characteristics of these phenomena. That information in turn helps us to understand aeolian erosion and sediment transport processes across the surface of Mars, uh, which has implications for both orbital remote sensing observations as well as ground-based rover operations. And while some dust devils are large enough to be observed from orbit, I don't think they'll pose much risk to future astronauts. Another major finding by the Spirit rover was the identification of magnesium iron carbonates at the Comanche outcrop. The fact that these rocks even exist gives us some clues about past climatic and aqueous conditions, although more information and work is required to sort out exactly how these rocks were formed. So regardless of how they were emplaced, one of the notable characteristics of these rocks are that they're 10 times richer in magnesium and iron than previously studied Martian rocks. The last finding from Spirit that we'll discuss is the discovery of concentrated amorphous silica just beneath the surface that was found when the rover was dragging along a stuck wheel uh, that created a shallow trench. It's thought that this silica has a hydrothermal origin um, and it doesn't show a lot of evidence for modification after it was in place, indicating that aqueous alteration didn't happen for an extended period of time. Uh, this finding gives us information about some of the aqueous processes happening in Mars's past uh, which we could then potentially use to be predictive about where we could find more deposits like this. So moving on to the Opportunity Rover, uh, like Spirit, some of the major findings revolve around evidence for past liquid water. Uh, in this case, uh, Opportunity found several minerals that are listed on this slide that form in the presence of liquid water and shows that this region once had an active hydrologic cycle. 
Uh, the hematite concretions called blueberries were a fairly popular discovery uh, that indicated a wet history. And the gypsum and clay minerals have the potential to be quite useful as resources, which we'll discuss in the next section. Opportunity also spotted an iron nickel meteorite, which was the first meteorite observed on another planet. To sum it up, Opportunity trekked significantly further than was anticipated and made several observations and discoveries that point to a wet history on Mars. The data from these rover missions has been studied with respect to its relevance towards past hospitable conditions for life. And from a material resources perspective, this also means that a wider variety of minerals are available on Mars' surface due to aqueous processes. And now we'll discuss further some of those potential resources. All right, thanks for that chance. And now we're basically gonna talk about what does this mean? Do, what do these findings tell us about the resources and the relevance uh, to space resources in general? So basically the two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, in general were astrobiologists and geologists and achieved the majority of their scientific objectives. Now, the most promising resources that they discovered that we might potentially be able to use for some sort of industrial process are silica carbonates. So that's magnesium carbonate and iron carbonate. Um, those are also sources of carbon and oxygen. Um, but, and then there are some hydrated minerals uh, such as gypsum, and these are potentially sources for water in the lower latitude regions. Now you can't only rely on these kind of minerals in the region, the regions that they landed um, for these particular resources because they're not in ex high abundance. Um, however, it also depends on the extraction energy um, and particular concentration of these resources in their in situ locations. So the resources for further investigation, however, they did discover meteorites on the surface. Those are iron, very positive source of iron. Um, clay minerals could be used for construction in 3D printing. Um, the clay minerals are abundant across the surface like kaolinite, um, aeolinite, montmorillonite, um, smectites, things like that. So evaporite minerals as well were present um, to gerocide, but these are not in high, very high concentrations and the energy requirements for them make it so that it might not be um, that plausible as a resource, but um, it is used in uh, purification and hydrometallurgy. That's one example of a use for it in industrial processes. Um, but the weather and dust patterns that we've learned from the rovers as well uh, show us the dust devils on Mars and dust transport and the mean grain size of dust in the atmosphere transport in suspension. Um, this all tells us about how uh, we need to deal with dust mitigation and with solar arrays in the future, uh, as well as with uh, robotics on the surface of Mars. All right, so some open questions. What is the nature and distribution of the resources and where did they come from and when? The silica may have originated at deep or near the surface. It's from the interaction with water, most likely hydrothermal conditions. Uh, gypsum, also interactions with water. It very, it, does it vary with depth? Is it only in these fractures? Carbonates, are they more widespread than, than just at the surface? Um, and we would need to characterize the hydrologic cycle then. That, uh, but then for other hydrates and evaporite minerals, we would wanna figure out how much energy does it take to separate out the different uh, elements in the mineral? Uh, how many other sources of sulfur and phosphorus are, are there? So for, those are very useful elements for use in uh, food and agriculture on the surface of Mars and water is the most important of, of all of these is how pervasive are these hydrated minerals and how easy is it to get the water out of them. Is there still water frozen in the subsurface at all in these locations and it just hasn't been detected yet um, and because we don't have anything that drills deeper than a few centimeters um, beneath the surface uh, even today. Uh, but we need to basically drill further down and then determine the composition of uh, these materials, not just at the surface, but at depth. 
So the follow on missions, a lot of them are actually currently still active. As we know, the Perseverance rover just landed recently in Jezero Crater, and we have the helicopter with it. Uh, and the Mars Science Laboratory mission, that's Curiosity, that's still there. Uh, I landed in 2011. Um, we have the Tian Wen 1 mission that also is just landing uh, on Mars as well, that launched in 2020. Uh, and we have four other future planned missions. Uh, my idea is that we need to send more missions to Mars to the icy regions. So Flagra Montes, Coral of Crater, uh, Coral of Crater, if we would just land something right in the middle of it and deter and learn a lot about the ice and like drill a core sample down into it, that would be pretty cool. Um, and so I mainly suggest in the future the surveying uh, with rovers, drones, drilling robots and geophysical equipment. Um, this is in, com in combination with LIDAR and ground penetrating radar to constrain uh, all these different properties. Ultimately, the Mars rovers did an excellent job in figuring out the past life potential on Mars. The fact that there, yes, there was water there in the past and that yes, there may have been conditions possi possible for life um, and the habitability level was potentially higher than it was than it is today uh, so thank you so much and i thank you guys so much for listening and have a great day